So our last session here, um, a few weeks back, uh, I had the privilege to go out to Stanford and uh, meet Secretary George Schultz. I've met with him a couple of times. Um, he's a fascinating individual. His resumes in your program, um, I mean, from serving as a Marine artillery officer in World War II to, to four cabinets under three presidents, starting with President Eisenhower. He's 98 years old, um, an immense amount of both knowledge and wisdom. Um, and so we take the interview, and I'll step off, and if you can roll it. Um, he has a lot of advice on where he sees where the world needs to go. So we'll play the tape. I'm here today at Stanford University at the Hoover Institute with Secretary George Schultz. And we're going to talk about energy and especially some of the things that the Secretary is doing now and maybe draw on some of his incredible experience serving for three Republican presidents on four different cabinets, starting with President Eisenhower, President Nixon, President Reagan. Mr. Schultz uh, started his career at Princeton University, graduating in economics, served in the South Pacific as a Marine Corps officer during World War II, went back to MIT, got a PhD in economics, taught at MIT for some period of time, also served as the Dean of the Chicago School of Business, the president of the Bechtel Corporation, was the author of the Montreal Protocol, and used his experience uh, advising these presidents on many global issues. And today we're going to talk about a number of energy issues, including some of the current work that Mr. Schultz is doing with former Secretary James Baker on the Climate Leadership Council about a revenue neutral carbon tax. So it's great to be here and hear these words of wisdom from such an esteemed statesman as George Schultz. So Mr. Secretary, I uh, just really want to say thank you for your time to talk. Um, I'm always anxious to propagandize some people interested in the subject of energy. It is a key component of our life and economy. So I've had the fortune, this will be the third time I've met with you here, and I've just always been thrilled to hear your views on energy. My world is energy. and to have someone uh, with your experience to engage in the conversation, I think is great. Um, it's such a rapidly evolving topic right now, and it's maybe changing faster now than it's ever changed. And we, we've moved from essentially a state of scarcity to a state of abundance, but that's created a whole new set of challenges for us. And even with abundance, there's still a preponderance of energy poverty around the globe. And then there's the whole issue of global sustainability on the environment and advancing uh, those developing countries where they can advance their standard of living. And you know, you kind of have these pillars uh, around you know, the economy, the environment, the, the climate and things. Um, we're just hoping for our audience that we may be able to garner some of your wisdom on some of the enormous global challenges you faced under multiple presidents and maybe put, put some of that in perspective. So, you know, with, with that, maybe we, we just get started. You've faced a lot of challenges over your career, in, enormous challenges that, that seemed daunting. But now you're really very focused on one challenge of climate change, and you have a deep concern over this, maybe you could just tell our audience how you got involved in that, what your concerns are, and then we can work into some of the very pragmatic solutions that you've put on the table to actually advance progress at a time when progress seems to be pretty slow, if at all. Well, right now, the subject of energy is went right up there in the number one category. As soon as you say, think about energy, you have to say, 
We need something that runs our economy. We need something that pays attention to our national security. And we need something compatible with a good environment. And the relative um, challenge of each one of those changes over time. Right now, I think we have, we see enough energy to run our economy well. We don't have to worry so much about that and national security. But the environment is a challenge because the climate is getting warmer and there are consequences. I say it's getting warmer because you have to say to yourself, why is there a new ocean being created in the Arctic? Why is the ice mass over Greenland melting? Why are tropical diseases coming north? They're all because of climate change. We're having a meeting here at Hoover in another couple of weeks on the relation of climate change to health and disease. It's huge. So this is something we need to be paying attention to. And I think there are two things that can be helpful. Number one, put in place a system that calls people's attention to the need to do something about the CO2 they emit. My suggestion on that is a healthy revenue neutral carbon tax. I say revenue neutral because it's not a way to raise money. And by passing the money back on an equal amount to each person, say with a social security number, you make it a progressive tax and you avoid having it be a tax that has a fiscal drag to it. So that's why I'm very um, insistent on the revenue neutral aspect of this. So put that in and, and let it be a significant amount and let it rise by legislation so people can see that and people will start thinking about how do I deal with this problem. And then second, you want to put a lot of effort into energy art research and development. I chair the MIT advisory board on their energy program and I pay a lot of attention to what goes on here at Stanford. And I see these scientists and engineers working on this and they are making headway. It's really astonishing. Solar and wind power are competitive now. That didn't used to be the case. It's because of the R&D. They are working hard and they will get to a large scale storage of electricity. That's a big breakthrough because it means you take the intermittency problem away from the solar and wind energy. So that's a big thing. And then many other things going on. I have had solar panels on my house here at Stanford for quite a few years. I've long since paid for them by what I've saved on my electric bill. I drive an electric car and the panels produce more electricity than my car uses. So my, my cost of fuel is zero. What's well, not to like? It works. And so there are things happening that give us advance on these matters. And more things will happen if we keep the energy R&D. And one of the interesting things about it is that here at Stanford and also at MIT, the federal government's program cost is, uh, is more than matched by its three to one private funding. Because when private people interested in the subject see a worthwhile program, they want to be part of it. And so that's the case at MIT, it's the case here. And some people say, oh my goodness, you're going to have private interest involved in the university. And we say, it's good because we know something about the R&D, but we don't know how to commercialize something and scale it. But these guys do. So it's good to have them involved if you're going to get something done. So we're very happy about that. So I think these are things that need to be pushed hard. So for our audience in Oklahoma, <coughs> and just for you putting it in perspective, what I'll call the heart of energy country, Oklahoma is number two in the nation in wind power, number three in the nation in natural gas production. You've articulated the compelling economics of how renewable energy uh, has become more competitive in the marketplace. But I know you've also been a supporter of natural gas as part of a complementary uh, component, significant component of the energy system. And for example, your work with Dr. Mark Zoback here at the Stanford Natural Gas Initiative on 
how to make the development of natural gas compatible and done right. Can you talk a little about um, sort of uh, your motivation with Dr. Zobeck and the Natural Gas Initiative? Well, if you say to yourself, what fuels um, are the best in terms of giving you the energies that you want, but not having so much CO2? What about coal? What about gas? oil? What about natural gas? Natural gas is the best by far. And nowadays it's being produced economically, so it's not so expensive. And I might say that the LNG side of natural gas is also getting a lot of attention. So there is a security aspect to it. For instance, as Russia looks down its nose at the Baltic states, they need to have LNG, so they're not so dependent on Russia. So there's a security element to this. The natural gas is very important in every way. So you've talked about the revenue neutral carbon tax, um, letting the markets participate and be involved in this, but you also had a unique experience in the Montreal Protocol and you, I believe, called that an insurance policy that you talked to President Reagan about. And I've heard you talk in the past about the comparison of that methodology of the development of the Montreal Protocol, which by all accounts seems to be a huge success. And can you talk about how that came about and, and how that same plan of attack could parlay into the revenue neutral carbon tax insurance policy, if you will? Well, my own experience started out when I was Secretary of Labor in 1969. And for some reason, the president made me the chairman of a cabinet committee on the oil import program. President Eisenhower thought that if we imported more than 20% of the oil we used, we were asking for trouble in national security terms. So we had a quota system. We're beginning to bump up against it. That's the reason for it. So we studied the subject carefully, and we made a nice report. It was published. The president patted me on the head. Thank you for the report. There were congressional hearings, but nothing happened. And we recommended some obvious things, like let's have some storage as an insurance policy. Let's change the quota system to a tariff system so we get the rents, not Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. We said energy is a strategic resource. We know more about it than anybody else in the government. There should be a government agency of some kind paying attention, and a few other things like that. Nothing happened. Then I become Secretary of the Treasury a few years later, and here comes the Arab boycott of oil. And all hell broke loose. A lot of electricity was produced by oil in those days. So gas stations were closed on weekends, Christmas lights were discouraged, made a gigantic impact. And we've had a study made here of the contribution of more efficient use of energy. And it's really huge. And the inflection points are all 1973, because it made a big impact on the American people. And I might say that all of our recommendations were put in effect right away. So I learned it takes more than a strategic analysis to get something done. And if the moment arrives when you get something done, you can get it done if you're ready. If you're not ready, it's liable to slip away from you. So a few years later, I'm Secretary of State. And it becomes more and more clear that the ozone layer is depleting. And if that happens, it's a very serious matter. And I had twice a week private meetings with President Reagan. And he and I talked about this. And he became convinced that it was a big problem. So most of the scientists thought that was right. But there were perfectly respectable people who didn't think so. So rather than do what people do now, and which is to try to murder your opponents, Ronald Reagan put his arm around them. And he said, we, we don't agree, but you do agree that it just might happen. And if it does happen, you agree that it would be a catastrophe. So we take out an insurance policy. And so he got the, that, you can get them with us, but it got them off our back. 
And out of it came what's called now the Montreal Protocol, which effectively dealt with the problem. So that was a big lesson. And I think Ronald Reagan's idea of an insurance policy is applicable today. People who doubt that the climate is changing, like the president, ought to say, well, you know, it just might be possible I'm wrong. So why don't I take out an insurance policy? And rather than have the government tell you, do this, don't do that, and regulate the daylights out of you, put a price out there and let the market work. The price system works. We see it over and over again. And I think if we put a price out there, it will work. And of course, at the same time, if somebody decides that they want to do something, we have to say, well, then here are some ideas of what to do. And that's why the R&D is so important. So what I'm hearing from you, President Reagan really exhibited leadership in an open mind to acknowledge that a problem could exist, as you say, even if very accomplished people didn't all agree on it and then well, put in place. Let me just build on something you said. President Reagan exhibited leadership. He exhibited leadership on the economy, on national security, on a relationship with the Soviet Union, on nuclear weapons, and also on this. He had a way of doing things and getting things done and seeing what the point was. He was a fantastic president. I just wish you were around here right now. So as part of your uh, advocacy now on the Revenue Neutral Carbon Tax, you've worked with Secretary Baker and you all were co-founders of the Climate Leadership Council and you've articulated in sort of the founding pillars of the Climate Leadership Council um, some of the things that have to happen and that's the Revenue Neutral Carbon Tax, the return of those monies to the general population in, in some form, um, that you would have some type of border adjustment um, so you could have, uh, make sure countries around the world with one atmosphere that everybody participates somehow. Um, and then I think you've mentioned this before and I think it's a very important point of it. If you let the markets work, it actually diminishes the need for prescriptive regulation and you, and you sort of let the market go. In, in our program, we would reduce drastically the amount of regulation substitute the price system for it. You mentioned one thing that I didn't mention, but it's important. And that is we would also have a border adjustment tax. So it's an import from some country that didn't pay it adequate attention. They would pay a price for that. So it's a way of getting the things spread around the world. I found it fascinating in reading through the Climate Leadership Council, the CLC, um, the way you identified what the impediments were. And some of those is, and it, it contrasts to say the market thinking, which is a short-term thinking for a long-term problem, which is a challenge. Um, you identified the, the notion of free riders. So it's sort of a tragedy, the commons that everyone benefits, everyone needs to participate and how you, you overcome that. And then I think today, especially you have sort of the red-blue divide, um, and I'll call another one the, the sort of green-brown divide. So um, the environmental movement is fighting the fossil fuel industry when it seems like there could be areas for collaboration. Um, Actually, in terms of the fossil fuel industry, Exxon has signed on to our plan, Shell has signed on to our plan, so it isn't as though they don't pay attention. A lot of companies have signed on. And practically every economist you ever heard of has signed up to our plan. It's interesting how long it takes, though. It was at least 10 years ago that a very uh, fine economist named Gary Becker and I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal with us advocating this. And that sat there and people discussed it. And then it gradually took off. And now it's really a player. From your experience, especially as Secretary of State, and if you look at the trends globally now, there's a, a very rising movement of nationalism. And if you have a challenge like climate change, that's a global challenge with one atmosphere, 
it, it really requires a collaborative solution. What are your thoughts on, on how you can overcome the sort of rise of nationalism to get countries and leaders to work together? That, that seems like a really large challenge. I don't think it's nationalism so much as it is issues of one kind, nationalism being one of them, that tends to command people's attention. And they can't pay attention to too many things at once. And the climate change is coming at them. And I take a leaf out of my experience as Secretary of Treasury that I mentioned to you when the Arab oil part hit and we had a calamity. And more and more people are looking at the climate aspects and saying, wait a minute, we've got a calamity on our hands. The health hazards are large and growing and we're not paying adequate attention. Tropical diseases come north, we can identify them, we can get up our diagnostic, we can get up our treatment, we can make, we fix these mosquitoes, they aren't much of a problem. Let's get going, let's do it. We don't have to have a lot of people die in order to see the sense of this. And there are other things like that that maybe will dramatize the problem a little more. You've, you've written both in Climate Leadership Council but in other places some of these solutions really have to address sort of inequality, uh, the developing world, and some of the impacts, as you see, of climate change disproportionately impact those populations. Well, one of the reasons why in our proposal we say, let it be administered, say, by the Social Security Administration. That's a bureaucracy that takes in money and pays it out. So let the money flow into them, and then they pay it out to anybody who has a social security number, an equal amount. That means you're redistributing it on a basis that makes it a progressive operation. So we're paying attention to the inequality issue and the way this is being set out. If I look back in your career and some of the big global crises you faced, whether it was nuclear missiles in Europe with the Soviet Union, or whether it was the Lebanon crisis where the marine barrack was bombed, or whether it was in Latin America with Nicaragua or China and Taiwan, just what I see as daunting immediate tasks at hand. How do you, how do you rate your concern of climate change? It's different, but it's, it's similar, and is the approach the same? in the way you handled those other issues? Well, it's different in the sense that this is not the product of some country after some other country. It's a question of something that's happened on a global basis. And that means you have to have global buy-in. And if so the problem of free riders is important and the ability to reach out and get people involved is important. The Paris Accord didn't have a lot of teeth in it, but it did bring the international community together and say, yes, we have a problem. That's the, not the finish, that's the beginning. But that's a necessary beginning and very important. And then you can start working on implementation. And the more through your R&D you can find things that people can do that make sense to them. Like I said, my Solar panels now give me fuel for my car. It doesn't cost me anything. So it's not a bad idea. Uh, you say the gas price has gone up, so what? I don't care. It's not my problem. So I think we want to look for things like that. And there's things are coming along. So you're doing your work, your important and impactful work here at the Hoover Institute at Stanford. You've been a, a very, uh, strong supporter of the Natural Gas Initiative. But that kind of work needs to happen other places too. So if, as I say, in the heart of energy country in Oklahoma, you have the captains of industry there who really in a large part have been responsible for the shale boom and this enormous new resource of and Very gas. important. So what advice would you have for those leaders as they contemplate their, how they position their companies uh, to 
to participate as part of the solution. Um, what, what advice do you have for them and what advice do you have for those universities like University of Oklahoma and in the things that they should be doing to drive change where so much of the nation's energy and now the globe's energy is produced? Well, I think the universities should make themselves part of the R&D effort that's going on around the world, and I'm sure they are. And I know the people at Stanford and MIT are always happy to collaborate, to send people there, have people come here, and so on, and, and have a broad joint research enterprise. So that's one thing. I think anybody operating a shale uh, operation or whatever ought to be thinking, how do I conduct this in such a way that we minimize the amount of damage done in the process. And um, I'm sure that there have been big improvements along the way. I also think that the shale not only produces oil, it produces gas. So how you maximize the gas in that combination I think would be worthwhile. I was out here this fall, uh, in fall of 2018, at the Global Energy Forum. Yes, that was, that was a great forum. It was. You were a speaker, Bill Gates, several other secretaries, Secretary Chu, Secretary Rice, um, among others. And it was a, it was a great discussion. I, I came away a little bit like the problem was almost insurmountable. Um, and I was looking for what the solutions are, are going to be. And as I've looked at your work, and especially like efforts like the Climate Leadership Council, and you know your advocacy with Secretary Baker, and just both of you are you know Republicans and from a Republican administration being sort of the leading voices on this issue. But I still came away with the feeling like we could be doing more, and I I love your. Uh, reference to President Reagan and he just put his arms around those he disagreed with and said let's acknowledge this and so my question is how do we push those solutions faster? well let me give you a um, way of thinking I used to be in the construction business and if you say to me as a construction guy build me a bridge across the Potomac River I sink my piers out of my steel, I put it together, you can buy a truck over, problem solved, done with that. If you say to me, build the bridge in such a way that no lost time accidents while the bridge is being built, and I put up some guardrails and I think I've solved the problem I've lost, because it's not a soluble problem. It's what I call a workout problem. And if you work at it hard enough, the first thing you do that happens to you if you go on one of our jobs was you get a safety bill, no matter who you are. And you're told about safety and you're told about your own performance and you're told if you see something that looks, tell us right away, immediately. So we do something about it. And if we work at it consistently, professionally, carefully, constantly, while the bridge is being built, we just might get it built without a lost time accident. But that's because we realize it's a work at problem, not a soluble problem. So I think this climate issue is like that. It is as though there's a solution out there if you could just find it, and that's the end of it. You have to keep working at it. And a little bit here, and a little bit here, and a little bit here, and a little bit, let it add up. As I said earlier, I think people don't begin to understand how important it is to use energy more efficiently. And when you do that, it makes a huge difference. I know I, I used to work at Bechtel, and we had a big electricity problem here in California at one point. So we dimmed the lights in our corridors. Actually, they were on too strong, so it didn't bother anything. And we, and we had a lot of people traveled in those days, so we said, if somebody's not coming into his office or traveling, don't turn the lights on. And if you leave, turn them off. And we saved a huge amount by paying attention. So we pay attention to saving energy, we pay attention to all kinds of little things and they add up. So I think you have to get it on your mind as something to do. And yes, there'll be a breakthroughs will come along. But in the meantime, all the little things, turn the lights out when you leave the room. 
my wife and I have, my job is to turn lights off, her job is to turn them on. So we have, we have a distribution of duties, but I go around turning lights off all the time. So I've asked you what executives in the energy industry can do, how they can engage. Like this, as, as you've witnessed this incredible evolution in energy, you know, uh, from where we've gone, this scarcity to abundance and all the diplomatic issues that raised and, and now moving to, you know, your pillars of the economy and security and the environment. If you now target sort of the younger members of the audience and especially those considering energy as a field of, for their profession, what advice would you have to the younger generation from your experience, um, things they ought to be considering and, and just how the changes you've seen over your career? You talk to the younger people and they are very conscious of the climate problem. This is their future. I'm 98 years old, so what's the future? Actually, I have six great-grandchildren, and I watch these little kids. They're curious about everything. Every once in a while, one of them learns something. Look at you and laugh, and look at me, I just learned something. And you say to yourself, what kind of a world are they going to inherit? And what can I do to make it a little better? And I think we all need to be working at it as a workout problem and do all the little things we can do to make it better. Some things are big things, some things are little things. But if you just keep at it all the time and they let them see that you're working at it, that's inspiration. So the first time I met you here, and we'll wrap up in, in respect to your time, and I just I want to thank you for your time and the powerful message you have, and it's so motivational, inspirational for all of us who spent our career in energy, but I, I love your perspective, all the photos in this room of you with different heads of state. And the first time I came here, you, you took me to a photo and your, your ballroom dancing with Ginger Rogers. And that was the picture of all the pictures well, White House, you took me. Nancy to. Reagan always fixed me up with a Hollywood starlet as my dinner partner at White House dinners. So that's how I got to dance with Ginger Rogers. And I sent her the picture of us dancing and she wrote on it, Dear George, what fun, for the first few minutes I thought I was dancing with Fred. Let's do it again, love Ginger. That's as good as it gets, fellas. That's as good as it gets. And I think that's a great note to close on. So again, thank you very much. And thank thanks you. for and, all you've done. And I'm country. very glad to see, hear about people working on the energy subject and trying to get it right the economy, security, the environment. Right now, the environment, I think, deserves special attention. So thank you all for hanging out. That was a lot of fun on that interview, and the wisdom there is, is just amazing. So thanks again, and look forward to doing this again next year.